If I were to tell you I'm a big fan of tea, I'm sure you'd have a very specific image of me, and I, I wouldn't blame you. The vast majority of the time, it's the first thing people tell you about themselves is, is tea-related, and they're going to be a little too into tea. Me, though, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a tea guy. I just prefer the atmosphere of a tea house to a coffee shop, and for some reason I don't really want to discuss, I've spent a lot of my time in places made for quick meals. Rick, by the way. Another city, another sunset. Behind another small town skyline, another bad taste in my mouth from another job. The monotony only broken up by stops like this. This place has character, especially for who gives a shit Michigan. Tasteful rose paint and dark oak trim makes the tea house look like a rustic cottage. The windows are tinted and the interior warmly lit. I find myself a booth and take a seat in an overstuffed leather cushion. The table's immaculate and the smell of fresh-baked goods is thick enough it drowns out the lingering scent of gasoline and smoke from my nostrils. I predict beautiful tea and ugly prices, and when I'm brought a menu, I'm not disappointed. The waitress seems to linger for a moment, expectant. I assume the place has a small circle of regulars. Pay it no mind. If I were a tea guy, I'd bore the hell out of you with a rant about the selection. Thankfully for you folks, I'm not the type to overshare bad for business. For those of you in the know, though, just a beautiful selection of Northern England's finest, with a few blends I've never heard of from Holland. I decide to throw caution to the wind and order one of the Dutch blends, with the vowel-ridden names and a watercress sandwich. Coffee's black sludge to keep it going. Tea is an experience. The dark, fragrant blend I'm brought brings to mind memories of early childhood mornings. It's funny how smell works. I take my time. The bruise and baked goods clearing my mind. It's letting me relax and focus on the next leg of my journey. But as caffeine tends to do eventually, nature called. The bathroom... Would have been at home in my grandmother's house. Soft pastel colors, clean white porcelain, and limitless knickknacks, sprays, and magazines. I turn off the polished brass faucet, turn to leave. I know something's wrong the second my hand touches the knob. No, no give at all. My suspicions are confirmed as I try to turn it. It doesn't move a centimeter. I chuckle. Can't think of the last time a door was much of an issue for me. The knob wasn't any model I've seen before, and the more I look, the more I don't like what I see. Fuck me, I mumble, looking for a set of hinges. I find none. I slam on the door, screaming. As obvious as the situation is becoming, it makes no sense. After 15 minutes of kicking and screaming that should have alerted every hipster and old lady in the place, there isn't so much as a knock from the other side of the door. Soundproof. Awesome, I say, inspecting the lavatory. Air duct under a decorative cover is grated, the grate welded to a plate in the ceiling, and the object of size is cleverly affixed to the floor with hidden bolts or welds. The small lamps are hardwired into the wall, which is industrial cement under its flower-printed wallpaper. This place was made to keep people. What is obvious? Why is immediately eating away at me. There are dozens of reasons someone might want me to be in this kind of situation, but this place wasn't just made. And even if it was, no one's going to build a covert prison cell on the off chance I wandered in. You know, that, that's comic book shit. They'd send some tweaker with a pawn shop pistol. The prospect that this is just something I stumbled into doesn't provide me much comfort. I've been around the block a few times, but something like this, it it's out of my wheelhouse. After a couple of hours, I notice the silence. The pure, uncanny lack of noise. The place was nearly full when I came in, tea house or no. I should be hearing the sounds of commerce outside. If you're reading this, you're likely the kind of person that doesn't have to ditch your phone much. And probably asking why I wasn't calling 911. Well, unfortunately, my life has led me down a different path, and I find myself... Unfortunately, between phones... Thankfully, I've always been partial to a wristwatch, so I at least can mark the passage of time. I assume I'm being recorded, 
and spend the first 24 hours talking to whoever may be listening, dropping names, making offers, anything I can do to get some kind of response. Nothing. Fear and panic begin to set in on the second day. Hunger starts to tear at my stomach, and a sense of powerlessness and isolation sets in. By day three, my body's cramped and aching. My sleep coming on a hard cement floor disguised as tile. My brain is fogged from lack of food and proper rest. My mouth tastes of the gritty tap water, and I realize no one's going to be looking for me. Had this been before a job, I could be guaranteed the client would come searching, looking to take their payment out of my ass, and with the types of folks who employ me, it'd likely have been within hours. But as is, a private person such as myself, there's no deus ex machina on its way. Day three teaches me something about mints. The stale, clumped bowl sat on a small shelf at the bottom of the over the john cabinet, a thin layer of dust coated them, making me assume they were some form of decorative soap. Instead of ancient, likely turned pastel, mints, I was desperate enough to eat them, figuring any calories would be better than none. Friends of mine in prison should have told me that this was a bad idea. Toothpaste ulcers were a known thing. See, mint, especially cheap menthol-based flavoring on an empty let alone malnourished stomach, it's just about the worst thing you can do. I enter day four, puking blood and yellow bile. I wipe my mouth and stop dead on my trip to the low-pressure faucet to wash out my mouth. Those mints, the same ones that had burned through the remnants of my stomach lining, undistributed layers of dust and all, were back. This was impossible. At no point was I asleep or anywhere more than a foot or two away from the bowl. Close my eyes, shake my head, and wash out my mouth, putting this bit of information on the back burner for now. Day four, as I feel my tartar coated teeth start to ache, I realize I need to make a plan. I start this by going over every inch of the bathroom again, trying to find any flaw or object I can use to make an escape. I keep my focus thinking of the long conversation I'm going to have with whoever put me in this shitty saw knockoff. I peel back every bit of wallpaper I can. I rummage through every cabinet, I claw and pry every surface where it's even a remote possibility. By the time I nearly collapse, my rapidly thinning form soaked in sweat, I found something. But the objects in question just confused me further. A 1930s-style straight razor, yellowed pearl handle, a magazine from around the same time, written in a Cyrillic language I, I can't even begin to guess at, a rusted old fountain pen, and a worn leather-bound journal. What made these things stand out were small numbers hidden on each. The razor had a one etched into the back end of the blade, hidden by the handle. The magazine was issue number two. The fountain pen had a year embossed on its oxidized surface, the only legible number being three, and within a swirling, looping pattern burned into the leather of the journal. A four could be made out. My mind quickly concocts a scenario. Some idiot obsessed with escape rooms, maybe. I'm sure there's some obtuse way I'm intended to use these things to get myself out. That being said, I'm not the guy you want to piss off and give a razor to. At first, I latch on to the vicious truth as a torch against the dismal fatality of my situation. But then I begin to think about the mints. Someone had to replace them. That means someone has to come in. I turn the blade in my hand, fear and anger turning my brain into a derailed train of revenge and uncertainty. I dump the mints into the toilet and flush, their long-since-expired colors running the instant they touch the water, blending together and turning it an unhealthy brown. A few hours later, I feign sleep, my breathing low and shallow, waiting to hear that first footstep. I'm hurting. Nowhere near full strength, but I almost pity whatever unlucky bastard walks through that door. I don't hear the click of the doorknob. Or the first footstep. But I feel a cold gust of air blow into the bathroom. Strangely stale and dry. But I'm up in a flash, malnourished muscles screaming in protest, threatening to pull and cramp. 
He's a big guy, 230 at least, short, but with a worker's build to him. He's standing between the door and the bathroom counter. I'd prefer to just run, but there's no way I'm getting out of there without going through him. His brown suit's old and his long graying hair is greasy and matted. I grin as I grab his shoulder and spit him towards me. I slam the man up against the cement wall. A death grip on his oily, feeling suit. The razor's under his chin, but as I see his face, I freeze. It's a twisted, sunken, funhouse mirror mockery of the human form. A leering, jowl, pig-eyed abomination. It stares at me. The hatred in those tiny orbs chills me to the bone. I've been scared before, this guy. This guy could be a sideshow freak all he wants. He's still gonna bleed. I swipe the razor in an arc that should have left him clutching his ruined neck on the tile floor. But the blade passes through the man's body as if he were made of smoke. The laugh, it sounded like a chorus of dying rabbits, like human screams drawn from memory. I'm tossed like a toy into the far wall. I see out the door for the first time in days, and what's out there... This is the tea room. It's, it's far more, more like a, a bedroom. The thing looms at the far end of the tiny room with every passing second. Shadows deep in the air seems to take on a weight. And this creature, this ghost-like thing seems taller, more imposing. My heart's pumping too fast. I begin to see black spots along the edge of my vision. My nutrient devoid blood doing its best to keep me going. It's Rictus grin stretches. The spectre retrieves the razor from the floor, looking longingly at it. I try to push past the fear, to get to my feet, maybe make a run to the door, but there's a burst of pain in my chest. Broken ribs for sure. The pain and shock makes me fall flat on my face. I try desperately to get up, but I can't manage to do it. I feel grateful as the darkness overtakes my vision, knowing whatever this man or thing has planned for me, it's better I don't see it coming. I wake up to a headache brought on by hunger and dehydration. The bathroom is immaculate again. The lights are lower and there is a weight, a palpable sense of wrong in the air. And then I hear it. I can't! It's a thin voice. Female. Young. She says more, but no matter how hard I listen to the sourceless voice... I can't is all I can make out. It repeats at erratic intervals, seeming to come from random points in the room. I drink, but the tepid water sits like a rock in my stomach, and as I watch the thin trickle in the dim light, I notice the colors off, slightly rust-tinted. I attempt to use the toilet and find it no longer flushes. My grim laugh seems to echo in the tiny chamber. I have a hard time accepting something I'm sure you guys understood a few minutes ago. I try any way I can to convince myself this is all smoke and mirrors, but the weight of being in the middle of some kind of supernatural clusterfuck smothers me. I search the bathroom again. Everything seems to be a little more worn, but everything seems the same, with the exception of the razor being missing. I hear a scratching inside of the sink cabinet, small and quick, like something wants to get out. I gag, hot, acidic bile fills my mouth as I try and wash it out. I see a small, black, almost insect-like claw protruding from the faucet. It bends upward, tapping along the brass, extending itself about six inches before retracting inward. I decide I'd rather taste puke. I know I can't have much time left. Every movement sends bolts of pain through me, and if I don't get these ribs patched up, there's a real chance of punctured lung. Not to mention the fact I'm going on nearly a week without food. If this is all random chaos, I'm screwed either way, but I try to press on with the only clue I have. I begin to flip through the magazine, trying to find any scrap of text I can read. I'd done this a dozen times already the day before but I need something to keep my mind off the horrors that seem to be waiting just beyond every crevice and shadow in this place. And then I see it. 
something that wasn't there yesterday. An article in plain English, Poltergeist and Sacrifice by a woman named Laura Set. Poltergeist activity is often misconstructed as being caused by a particularly vengeful or evil spirit. Though there are some similarities to a haunting, poltergeist activity has a differing source, and therefore a different method of appeasement. Most often, a poltergeist manifestation is caused not by an individual spirit, but by the combined spiritual weight of an event, a true case of the total being greater than the sum of its parts. The negative energy, individual souls, and a history of the location, through as of yet unknown means, combine to create something more akin to a minor god than a powerful spirit. And as such, traditional methods of removal, such as those offered by various religious and mystic organizations, are ineffective. The only true way to keep manifestation at bay is via a complicated form of sacrifice. Often after recreating key parts of the event that trigger the manifestation. Sacrifices can run the gamut of trivial to lethal, but as seen, repercussions of an unchecked manifestation will seldom not be worth the cost. There was more to the article, but as I finished, the lights began to flicker and dim, and the magazine began to crumble in my hands. I can't eat. I hear the voice clearer now. I still can't make out all of what she's saying, but she sounds clearer. The room's no longer silent. The scratching and tapping from the sink is more rapid, more purposeful. I can hear faint music outside of the room. An old phonograph, I think? The hellish orange strobe of the lights turns shadows into looming creatures. I can't tell what starvation-induced hallucination and what's some kind of force I'll never understand. I'm rattled and unhinged. I scream at the girl to shut up. But of course she doesn't listen. I think about praying, but me and the guy upstairs haven't been on good terms in a long while. I see movement on the ceiling. I feel the humidity rise and get the sense of something unstoppable starting to gain steam. My mind wants to think of nothing but the things in the shadows. I feel something thin and rubbery caress my cheek in a moment of darkness and force myself to think about the pen. In a eureka moment, I try to jam the nib into my arm, but it passes through mockingly. But in the flash of orange light, I see something. The corner of the counter is cracked and rotten now, caked with rust-colored, half-congealed blood. Jagged splinters stick out like grasping fingers, and I laugh a sick chortle as I, I realize what I have to do. I slam my forehead into the serrated corner, screaming in pain. The sound and echo of my fraying sanity, the wood and steel, tear a massive piece out of me, my starvation-thinned flesh splintering like an overripe pear. And for a moment, I see it, just a flash. A trapped little girl, an evil old man. Long before they became gears in the horror-producing machine. When I snap out of it, the room is dark. The sounds of formless things all around me. For a brief second or two, one of the lights produces a dim glow before going out. My left hand isn't working. Must have hit a tendon or a nerve. I uncap the pen with my teeth, holding it under the torn limb. The blood seems to give the pen weight well beyond its few milliliters. I can't eat. I need... The girl says. Her voice seems right next to me now. In another dim flash of a dying bulb, I see a twisted mass of clicking tendrils scraping my blood and flesh greedily from the counter. I hear laughter real and followed with hot, reeking breath. I turn to see a leering, faceless grin illuminated and formed out of the wall. The room feels more claustrophobic by the second. The things I see in the sparse, dull, orange flashes of light seem to focus on me. Tendrils like hot smoke begin to wind around my leg. A hand, massive and not quite human, grasps my shoulder. 
I feel swarmed by things I can neither fathom nor see. I study my breathing and wait. I know I'll have to write something, but what? The dull orange glow like a dying candle gives the barest of light. I flip through the journal, seeing nothing but blank pages. I clench the pen in my teeth, hard enough to crack one of my molars. The glow dies and my heart sinks, but as I flip a page, I feel something, some indent. The hand pushes down on my shoulder as the tendrils begin to pull me up towards the sink. I have no strength to fight. It, it takes everything in me to keep conscious. I see the cavern of pitch black I'm being dragged towards as the light pulses, the glow barely able to pierce the gloom. This place has turned into a senseless hellscape, but I see it. I can trace the outline with my hand as if someone is pressed too hard with a pen, see the indented words and begin to trace over them with the pen. I'm sorry. I have to roll over my damaged arm, tearing out a page and slipping it under the door. Something inside the limb snaps and I feel a deep pain shoot up to my elbow. For a moment, I'm sure I guessed wrong. My foot inches from the onyx fanged maw of the sink cabinets become, but then din of the hellscape switches off. I no longer feel the unholy presence of whatever unnatural things were slipping from the cracks in reality. I'm standing in a void. Still calm as death. In every direction but one is nothing but endless nothing. The bathroom mirror floats, fixed in space. I feel myself drawn to it in awe of it. I see the girl for the second time, and I'm overwhelmed with sadness. She's a flickering, pale thing. Her body's broken, the victim of a kind of violence the worst person I know wouldn't even think about. I can't eat. I need... I hear. The voice is soft this time, almost sweet. Of all the wounds on the girl, the one that stands out the most is her destroyed wreck of a mouth. I feel mad for her, despite my situation. I hear her crying now, and the situation starts to come together. The starvation, the entrapment, the torture. They fit together like the combination to a safe. I see the forms of dozens of people to either side of her as she closes the distance. She's right in front of me now. When I finally hear her clearly, it sounds different. Like I'm hearing a recording of events. I can't eat. I need teeth. I hear her as her dead eyes hold me in a trance. She raises one hand. The cold, dead flesh gently rests on my cheek. It passes through the cheek harmlessly, but as it makes contact with my teeth, I feel the worst pain I've experienced. A pain so severe as it overshadows the mindfuck itself. A pain I wake up most nights in a cold sweat about to this day. She scoops them out like gutting a pumpkin. I can't beg or pull away. I can't even scream, even as each inch of movement has me internally begging for death. There isn't blood. In fact, if I didn't know any better, I wouldn't even know I ever had teeth. But as the apparition stares at them greedily, that's cold comfort. The girl walks away, and after a few paces, reality comes crashing back down around me. On my side, my arms stopped bleeding, but the flesh looks like it's melted away, fused and bubbled as the door opens. I have enough strength to stand, but I'm not sure how long it'll last. There's a dozen people outside of the door. In front of me is a well-kept man in his fifties, in what looks like his Sunday best. Thank you, he says, handing me a comically small towel for the amount of filth and blood I'm covered in. I can do nothing more than glare at the group as I leave, holding onto the wall for support. I got out of that town and went dark for a while. Mostly getting used to the lifestyle changes a week or so of malnutrition and torture can cause. But that brings me to why I decided to, pun intended, 
spill the tea here. See, I've got a question. Do I keep myself hidden? Take this as a win? Never look back? Or do I maybe try and get a little non-divine retribution? I don't know how possible that would be, but I guess that's... That's where you all come in. Let me know what you think. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening to tonight's podcast if you're listening on Spotify. And thank you guys for doing that thing where you subscribe, where you hit the bell, where you hit like, or you leave a little comment at the bottom or wherever you can leave comments at. I don't know. I don't use Spotify that much. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life. And Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough.